Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Urška Petrovčić. I'm a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, and I'm a director of economic strategy at Qualcomm, and I'll be the moderator for this session. So I know it has been a very long day. I know a lot of interesting discussion, but I also know that everyone is now waiting for the cocktail reception, so I'll make sure that we will not run over time. Um, so we have heard many interesting topics today. I think this panel is particularly interesting because we have here people with real expertise on the ground. We have people that have been involved in drafting the US standardization strategy. We have people that go to standard development organization and do the actual work. So I'm sure we can really learn a lot. Uh, before jumping into the discussion, I just wanted to take a step back and um, take a step back and think a little bit about what an important source of <coughs> innovation, economic growth, and prosperity open industry driven global standards have been. Um, we know th I know that we all kind of take it for granted, but if you pause for a minute and think at the about the impact that the standards are having. It's really, truly impressive. The standards are developed in a co cooperative process where companies from all over the world, their engineers, they meet together and they try to solve technological solutions. And we have seen that they have really have a massive impact. They really provide incredible technology. If, you, if we look at cellular technology, cellular technologies have provided the foundation for a mobile economy that has about 4.8 billion globally. 5G alone is expected to create or transform about 16 million jobs in the US alone. And cellular connectivity is today available to more people than electricity and running water, which is quite impressive. Now what we have learned today is that technology, global technological standards are not immune for, from politics. And they have become part of this geopolitical discussion. And as the geopolitical tension increased, some have, questions wh have questioned whether we need to rethink about this method of developing standards or whether you know whether we need to exclude certain areas or what should be done to on one hand preserve this system and the benefits it creates but also address the concerns that we have. So uh, here's my first question for the panel. So technology standards are no longer a niche topic that attracts the interest only of a small group of industry experts and have instead become a central component of the ongoing geopolitical discussion. In particular, the fact that some countries have increased their participation in standard development organizations has attracted the attention of many commentators, and some have called regulators to intervene. Uh, there have been a variety of proposals from excluding certain companies from certain regions to you know, completely revise the standardization process. So you are familiar with what is happening on the ground. What do you think are the major challenges, if any, that SDOs and standard participants face in today's world? What are the things that commentators are getting right, and what are those that they're not? Gordon, do you want to start? Thank you, and um, thank you to the organizers for uh, having this panel. I think it's terrific. Uh, I'm going to quote Kurti because uh, I was at last year's conference and uh, Kurti opened up with a line which I think reflects a lot of my thinking, which is sometimes the things that are easy to count aren't really worth counting. And if we look at the, the initiation of this particular focus on standardization, much of it happened because there was a recognition that China was participating more in international standards, particularly in technology standards, than they had in the past. And one of the things that gets to you to ask is, how do you judge whether the standard system is healthy? Do you judge it by how many people show up to a meeting? Are they from one country, one company? Um, do we judge it by the rules of engagement? Do we judge it by how many competing standards efforts there are on exactly the same or similar topics? Or do we really, really need the benefit of looking down the road into the future and understanding whether the filter that is the standard system, which hopefully filters out the bad and mediocre 
technical solutions and allows the best ones to rise forward are producing standards that get adopted, that facilitate products and services that can engage in our economic well-being and better our societies. You only see this in the future. You don't see this in the current times. And this is one of the challenges for the entire standards community to talk about this reaction that we're seeing to what's gone on in standardization recently. And I think this is something that can benefit from research and a little bit of help. Sometimes we can look back at standards opportunities that have already come and see what's happened. I do a lot of lecturing at universities about standards. And one of the interesting things about going to universities, especially talking to STEM students, is that everybody wants to be an innovator, right? Being an engineer in a big company is kind of passe. I want to be an innovator. And many of them question, well, why do innovators need standards? Don't standards really tie me down? And it's great that I'm here with Harry because Harry represents a standard that was truly an innovation of its time. IEEE 802.11, right, what we all call Wi-Fi. So those of you who aren't old enough to remember, when you engaged with the internet, you needed a wire. <laughs> Wi-Fi let us cut the cord. That in itself was an innovation. But on top of that, Wi-Fi has become a platform for a huge innovation space for new products and new services and new ways of living and working with others. And I think that is one of the reflections you have about how healthy standard systems move forward, help create innovations, allow for the market to uptake the best innovations, and have those innovations in and of themselves become the platforms for future innovations. Thank you. Harry? Uh, thank you. Um, what I'd like to... Uh, bring to this discussion of uh, this topic of uh, governmental influence and standards is a little bit of background about what we do in IEEE 802. Uh, the IEEE 802 SDO uh, invented Ethernet, standardized that, and continues to standardize future developments in Ethernet uh, as the 802.3 uh, working group focuses on that. The 802.11 uh, working group focuses on what we know as Wi-Fi today and continues to make progress in many areas uh, for the next generation of Wi-Fi after Wi-Fi 6. And in addition, there are other working groups such as 802.15, which um, is the basis for a lot of machine-to-machine -machine communications. In fact, there are probably 10 times more 802.15 based devices deployed in the world than 802.11. So that's an extremely popular standard. But we also have a working group called 802.18 and that's our regulatory um, technical advisory group. And that group interfaces um, uh, through to other organizations such as governmental regulatory agencies around the world. And it's through that working group that we establish the liaisons to receive inputs from uh, governments that would influence our standard as well as providing information that they may request about what we're doing in standards development. And I think that's, a, that's, that's created a healthy relationship to help guide the development of our standards in accordance with uh, and addressing the various concerns that people might have about you know, what we're doing. We're providing information and we're also receiving input through that working group, which then disseminates what they're hearing to the rest of 802. So you have one point of contact for that. And I think this model works pretty well. Um, our members are there as individual contributors. They're not there to represent uh, the companies they work for. They're not there to represent a government agency. They're there in their individual capacity. We make sure in every single meeting to reinforce the fact that you're here to make a technical decision based upon um, what you believe is the right thing to do as an engineer. And we expect all of our members to um, be up to speed on the technology they're voting on um, because we expect everyone to be an expert in the standard that is ultimately published as an individual. Um, and I think that kind of model is a model that has proven to be successful, and I think it's something that should continue. Thanks. Etienne? Yeah, thank you. Does that, yeah, I guess it's working? All right, cool. Well, thanks, thanks for this. Uh, Gordon and, Har and Harry, uh, what I wanted to add to this, right, is I mean, first, I'm, I'm happy that we're, we're looking at those three different perspectives because 
um, your you know your history is more on the IEEE uh, side and my background has been more from the communication theory on the cellular side so at least we can provide all those aspects uh, to the uh, to the audience here um, because I started my uh, standards career after doing some uh, R&D in uh, in 3GPP where I've been uh, basically participating chairing, being reporters or everything like this, and then moved out into other type of uh, standard bodies um, where we're now looking at more governance levels of, uh, of discussions um, and now in other topics like uh, security and uh, artificial intelligence um, for standards. So wh what I, I first wanted to take out of that is the fact that Effectively, we have very diverse standards uh, activities around the world and technical standards, but there's one thing which is very common to all of it is that those are engineers going to, or innovators, whatever we want to call them, right? But there's engineers who actually innovate, uh, who actually goes to the, go to those groups and really work out on the problem, right? And they really try to come there with their engineer mind and try to come up to a solution. Um, and those groups that we've been referring to they're very open so you have basically participation from the entire world and it's the type of participation that you see reflects the type of um, companies who comes from those different countries so the fact that they come from china elsewhere in asia europe or the us is effectively secondary in the standards bodies uh, so going back to your question uh Urska, when you were asking about you know, there's, it's coming now in the spotlight and there's lots of comments made about standard and influence a particular region versus another. Um, yes, there is definitely a higher participation from Asia, China in particular, because of course there's a market that has developed there and lots of companies that have developed there. Um, and, and of course that's an observation that is not, uh, that is not untrue, so it's definitely true. The, the part with, I think uh, they're not getting directly is what we're discussing here is the fact that those are engineers going there, working on trying to get solutions to problems which are posed to them, to basically be able to move forward the technology. And the more open you are and the more people you're able to attract to something that's successful, um, the better you can produce a, a good standard, basically a good, uh, a good technology solution. So effectively, wha if there's something I wish that those people who comment on it uh, would know or would do is basically that they go a bit behind the headline or the uh, things that are easy to count but not worth counting maybe and actually maybe go to a standards meeting and see how those things happen because you do have b basically engineers for the entire world who are fighting it off right trying to really try to get to the best solu technical solution to a problem so those are the uh, let's say under the aspect that they wish they would know a bit more Thank you. So let me go a little bit deeper into this. Harry, maybe for you. As Satyan mentioned, there were many reports that are factually correct that you know there has been increased participation from companies I from China in the standard development activities. What is your view? Is this a problem? Should we be concerned about this? Is China a threat when it comes to technological standards? Well, you know, I the IEEE 802.11 standard is a global standard, and, and in that respect, uh, we do want to see input from uh, members who are located all over the world. So uh, members from China are certainly welcome at our meetings. Um, members from other countries are welcome in our meetings. In fact, we're trying to expand the uh, country representation in our meetings, and that's a good thing. Um, I think that um, where the tension lies is when geopolitical issues begin to affect the way we're able to um, run our meetings. For example, um, there are certain visa requirements that restrict uh, engineers' participation in our meetings. We try to move our meetings around throughout Europe, the US, and, and Asia um, to try to get around those problems, but those are still issues that affect uh, development efforts. And, th and, and the other piece to it as well is that uh, you know, you do have um, concerns about, um, you know, countries that are, uh, that have different political systems than the U.S. and, and whether or not <coughs> their engineers uh, coming from those areas are, are being influenced in um, their standards development efforts. Uh, we try to combat that by, you know, making statements every, 
at every meeting that you shouldn't do that, but that doesn't mean it may not be happening. And that does rest, raise concerns. So, so there is con there's general concern, but nonetheless, we still want to be open to members from every country. Any other comments on this topic? Yeah, if I, I, I could add something to that. I mean, because uh, same thing from the, the, the cellular side of, of the groups that I'm, I'm looking at. It's the same thing that we've been uh, seeing, right? And indeed, there's, there's one aspect that was witnessed is that in particular uh, for companies from, from China, there is an ability for, from the uh, government to actually rally the troops, right? Which are more along a particular country preference rather than a particular let's say, technology preference, right? Um, so there's, there's that, let's say, behavior that has been observed in, uh, in, some, uh, in some votes. Uh, and of course, this is something that we definitely want to discourage. Um, that being said, I would not say that it's at the level right now that is critical in the sense that it's, it's really a problem to address. It's something where actually you, you do see a sort of uh, self-correction or self-governance within those groups, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, voting for a particular um, chair position or particular edi a particular editor position, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion that happens behind the scenes in all those groups, and you try to make sure that those companies understand that if there's too many representation from a particular country or if it feels that it's going to be too dominant, uh, then there might be repercussions, so there needs to be self-governance on that. And I have to say that as of now, we've seen some basically positive directions in where companies were themselves um, effectively recalibrating the amount of uh, input or the amount of uh, uh, positions that they wanted to, to get. I'm not going to say it's perfect, right? I mean, those, those are very big uh, groups. There's a lot of different dynamics. Uh, and sometimes when you have a direction which is, hey, try to get as many representative as possible on one particular uh, group, there, there's going to be inertia on that, but at least we've seen some self-governance uh, kick in. So that's the part that I'd like to uh, add to it is it's, you know, th these participation from different political system where you have government that are able to direct a bit more have been visible, have been witnessed, uh, but have also triggered reactions that mm -hmm. kind of self-correct. And just um, the self-correcting part of it, it's interesting for me. So uh, I've been involved um, with the revisions to the BIS entity list rule regarding standards uh, for quite a while. And, and I think this also has been a correction. Um, you know, we really saw this come out quickly in the last administration. Um, we listened to our stakeholders and we saw a lot of negative effects, um, not about China's participation in standardization, but about U.S. participation in these global standards. And so it took us a couple tries, uh, but I think we've gotten to a good place in the latest uh, revision to the standard. Uh, now it talks about a broad category of standards-related activities, which are exclusions to the entity list rule, that I think has really lowered the risk for U.S. companies and U.S. representatives to participate in standards. And if you look at the standardization strategy of the U.S. government's st strategy for critical and emerging technologies, you'll see that one of the cores is making the U.S. an inviting place for global standards meetings. Um, and it really does double down on free and open standardization system that embraces materially interested stakeholders. Yeah. So if I understand correctly, it's like let's not exclude companies, either Chinese or U.S., but let's make sure that, well, Let's try to encourage the discussion on here, but also let's make sure there are not abuses and that there is a rule-based system. Uh, Etienne, I want to go back to you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have heard in the, this morning several commentators have emphasized the importance of maintaining a global standardization system. Could you explain why is it important to maintain a global technology? Why is it important to maintain global technological standards rather than move to a bifurcated world? What would be lost if we move away from this global system? Yeah. So I okay. So on on this, I think the uh, the short answer would be that you know there's you you see the thing that you've lost on. You, you won't see the thing that you lost unless you actually lost it, right? Um, e effectively, this, this global technology standards uh, framework uh, 
you know, provides uh, amazing economies of scale for any implementer or innovator who wants to get into this space. Uh, if you don't have that, that anymore and you need to go back to a, a world where basically you have a, you know, a different plug, power plug diff per country, which you know, apparently still exists today, um, you, uh, you will understand why it's better to have a single plug that works everywhere. It would be great to have a single plug that works everywhere or a single cell phone that works everywhere, right? The way we have it today or single Wi-Fi equipment that uh, works pretty much everywhere. Um, you only see that when you've lost it, right? I'd rather that we don't uh, see it and we can at least uh, understand what it would mean to not have this. But I think the examples are, are everywhere of what happens if you lose this economies of scale and what happens for every equipment makers in the world when they have like two or three versions of their power plugs that they need to plug in um, and the amount of waste that you have to create for the planet in general, um, the amount of unsustainability that you continue when you do things like this. So I think, yeah, the, I mean, that's to me the uh, let's say simplest uh, answer to, uh, to that point. And Gordon, a question for you. China has published a st standardization strategy several years ago. Last year, the European Union published its own standardization strategy. And a few months ago, we have seen the publication of the US National Standard Strategy for Critical and Emerging Technology. I understand you were involved in the drafting. So could you summarize it? What are the main points of this document and how does it differ from the strategies we have seen in other countries? Sure, and I think Christian in the first panel hit the four key objectives. Um, the first one is investment in research and development in critical technologies. Um, the core of standardization is bringing the best technical contributions to the table. Um, everybody always asks how you win, do you pack the room, uh, do you tilt the rules? No, you, what you really do is go back to the basics, which is bringing R&D to the table that provides the platform for the best technical solutions. Um, and then there's the removal of barriers. Um, standardization um, can be expensive, uh, and not so much in travel and living costs what kind of the, the surface expenses are, uh, but for a lot of companies, sending people to standards meetings, even if they're virtual, is taking them away from that core business. And so those are some of the things we really need to think about is how do we reduce those barriers for companies, large and small, also for academia. Uh, how do we reduce these barriers to participation and uh, bringing contributions and influence into the global standard system? And then we have to look at workforce. Uh, it's been mentioned a couple times. This is actually my uh, core, <laughs> core issue a lot of times. Um, I always tell the story. I went to a university for electrical engineering. I joined IEEE because it cost 10 bucks. I got a free t-shirt and I got to put it on my resume. I never saw a standard until the first day I went to work at Underwriters Laboratories, which is one of the largest product safety standards developers here in the United States and certainly the largest testing and certification body in the United States. And it doesn't really make sense in electrical engineering because electrical engineers need to understand standards, at least as implementers of standards and how they impact the world that you work in. And so I've always seen the need to bring standards into education. Uh, right now, we have a curricular development program that my part of NIST sponsors. Uh, it just closed, the notice of funding opportunity just closed. We had 30 applicants from uh, universities to get grants from us uh, to bring university curriculum that brings standards in. It was already mentioned, I, I think, by Walt that the National Science Foundation now in their 2023 guidance uh, allows for standardization activities and research activities to be part of the merit contributions, um, as well as to spend those resources on the participation in standards. And these are all things that are really, really needed. We need a standard-savvy workforce. And it extends beyond STEM, because when you look at companies, companies are run not just by engineers, companies run by lawyers, companies run, are run by financial professionals, and they need to understand why that investment in standards is worth it, why it's worth it to spend bottom line dollars to send staff, engineers, and scientists into standardization to create that platform for the future. And, and so I think that is a big, big focus. Uh, and inclusivity is a big focus. And again, I think this kind of cuts against what we see from some of the other standardization strategies you've mentioned, that the US really believes that a open standardization process that's based on consensus rules is the best approach to standardization. Uh, and if we compare and contrast, right, so China in their 2035 standardization strategy said, we want China to be dominant 
in global standards. You don't really see that. You see us wanting to be competitive in global standards and competitive in global technologies. And in Europe, they've closed the horses around the European regional standardization bodies, right? And you know, particularly, I think it's going to affect ETSI uh, and where standardization requests flow from the European Commission into ETSI, uh, they will exclude uh, non-European organizations from participation in that standards development process. And I think we've heard throughout the day today some of the ramifications that are happening there. So I, I think unlike some of these other things, the U.S. strategy essentially references our historic approach to standards. As a matter of fact, we were very careful in naming it. So it's the U.S. government standard strategy for critical and emerging technology. And one of the first things we talk about is how this complements the American National Standards Institute's standard strategy, the private sector-led approach to standards that have served this country really well, well and, quite frankly, have served most of society very well. Thank you. Um, Harry, so as Gordon just mentioned, a significant part of the U.S. national standard strategy focuses on incentivizing further participation in standard standardization activities. So in a country like the U.S. that is based in a, on an industry-led process rather than a government-led process, what are the incentives that we need to encourage more companies to participate? Oh, well, I think that, um, you know, one, for example, one of the reasons that I participate in the meetings is because I, I do believe that uh, uh, as an engineer, we should be a U.S. born engineer, that uh, we should be interested in U.S. competitiveness in technology um, as a basis. Um, but beyond that, I think that um, what we can do to incentivize more participation is for people to understand the impact that standards such as IEEE 802 have on our daily lives. For example, there's a lot of concern about privacy, the use of technology and its impact on privacy. Well, in uh, 802.11, we're working on a next generation standard to randomize MAC addresses so that um, we address the privacy concerns from, from tracking. However, there's also the tension because you know, law enforcement wants to track people from time to time. You know, and so, or, or parents want to monitor what their kid, kids are doing online. So, so there's that tension going on. So, so, so the impact of this technology in society is only increasing. Um, so you can't just look at standards as just something that the nerds work on. It's something that impacts your daily life more and more. It, and it's becoming critical infrastructure to our lives. And for that reason, you know, we really do want to see more people get involved because it will impact you one way or the, or the other. You can't just ignore it. Get involved. Thanks. So can I just uh, yeah, chime please. in? So we are very, very interested um, in listening to the stakeholders to standardization. Uh, the standardization strategy has been published, and NIST has been given the charge to lead the implementation. And one of the things out of the box that we're doing is really listening. So NIST has a history of engaging with stakeholders in our work. So not only are we going to be doing listening sessions around the country, um, we're also going to publish a request for information that's going to come out that will help us get information about what the stakeholders to standardization see as the best things that we can be doing, not just at NIST and Department of Commerce, but across the whole government to bring more U.S. engagement and participation into standards development. And even before that, on standards.gov, which is the website for my organization, we have a little listening tab right now under the strategy tab. So if you have something to say to us and something to inform us about how we can be executing and implementing the strategy uh, in a way that you think will work, uh, we are happy to hear from you. Great. Uh, any suggestions on when the RFI will come out? <laughs> I think it'll be weeks, not years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Etienne, did you want to add? Yeah. Uh, no. Um, yeah. Just a, a small thing to add, and, and I, I have been, you know, trying to look for places where we can at least disagree a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but I, it's it's hard. But yes, I'll I'll, I'll try to find some, um, or or maybe to add some some more nuance. Uh, so. First, on, on the U.S. transition strategy, it's hard to disagree because, I mean, the, the text that we saw was, was really nice, um, the, in particular on the part of removing barriers to be able to participate. Um, anything that also would remove barriers for 
uh, anyone globally to participate would be great because you know that's the part of what we were discussing that we want people for and the entire world to be able to participate and solve those uh, technology uh, problems um, so that's you know no, no, no disagreement there um, the, the part where I wanted to uh, add a, a bit of, of nuance on the the way it's it's done right because Gordon, the way you were describing the uh, the way China has done their uh, what was it uh, standards 2035 or the or Europe's um, circle the wagon and uh, and try to make sure it's it's only them who are going to deal with it or only uh, national delegations are going to be able to to decide so the slight difference uh, I would say there is um, when you look at some of the, the the way the European standardization strategy um, tries to address things it's to me there's some aspects that make sense when you're talking about standards that have societal impact on their society that they set the requirements and that to me is fair because if you're in a particular society and you're setting up the requirements I mean you have your political system and you're going to set the requirements um, and so from from that I would say that it's kind of under purview to actually set the requirements the, the same way they're doing this EU AI act uh, today which you know hopefully will well hopefully I guess is going to pass by the end of the year and then uh, create some technical standards to for, to actually address those um, the part where I, I would agree that they I would have issues that they go um, down that path too much is when they actually get involved in the the way those technical requirements are fulfilled or actually you how you address them setting the requirements is fine but basically saying that no you're going to address it this way or this way that's becomes more of a problem because for that I would like to have the entire community of engineers to actually try to solve it but that would be the the difference I would uh, I would see Okay, well, you know, maybe we can start some controversy. Cool. <laughs> Bring it uh, on. <laughs> uh, you know, differences um, in implementation based on geography has always been something that's been a part of the wireless standards. Um, there are different regulatory um, requirements, such as, for example, avoidance of radar in certain countries is more stringent than in others. Um, the spectrum allocation is different in different countries. Uh, but the, and the reason why your, your phone works as you go across these geographies is because there's code implemented for every geography and it just simply switches when it knows it's in a particular environment. So as engineers, we, we know how to work around you know, the, the fact that different countries have different regulations. It's just that we need to be clear up front what those differences are so that we can build a system that works um, and doesn't break because someone's doing something strange. But we know how to deal with that. In fact, you know, there's this notion that every word in a standard is like an absolute requirement, and that's really not true. There's a lot of, in the standards that's optional, where so you don't have to implement it. And, 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 and also, there are parts of the standard that are intentionally ambiguous, because we want to allow manufacturers the ability to differentiate themselves in the marketplace with their own um, implementations, um, whether it's on, particularly on the receiver side of things. Um, so um, standards are, 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 like I say, not necessarily you know, um, cast in stone on, on every single aspect of how they work. Um, and I think that uh, allows for countries to weigh in on specific regulations that they want to see implemented. As long as we're clear on what they are, as engineers, we can make it work. Thanks. Gordon, I want to go back to you. You mentioned that the standardization strategy says that the U.S. will seek to remove and prevent barriers to private sector participation in standard development. So can you talk about a bit more about this provision? What are those barriers and how, are, how will you remove them? Well, I think that's part of what we want to listen about, right? So, and it's going to be different by different sectors and different standards development organizations. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I, I participate directly in some standards. If any of you have worn a, uh, a community mask uh, that meets ASTM uh, 3205, uh, I've been a part of that standards development during the pandemic. But the pandemic has really transformed perceptions across the standards community about participation. So the standards community has learned that while in-person meetings and building relationships with the participants in standards development is really important and core to moving the process along many times, that the standards community can also find ways to move their process forward through virtual participation. 
And the standards community didn't really miss much of a beat during the pandemic. And I think looking at some of those areas of meeting the pandemic challenge and continuing to produce good standards can really give us a snapshot into some of the ways we might be able to reduce those barriers. But as I said, the barriers are gonna be different. They're gonna be different for different communities, whether it's in academia or whether it's in small companies that are innovating and thinking about protecting their intellectual property and moving through the process to help develop standards that allow their products to be accepted in the market. Uh, all those are gonna be unique and we really need to hear from the community about how to move forward to reduce those barriers. Well, one thing I would say is that the pandemic did really affect the IEEE 802. Uh, we had to go from uh, in-person only meetings to completely online in a heartbeat. And that went on for several years. And what we noticed was that the rate of standards development slowed down. And part of the reason why is because a lot of the resolution of disagreements happens outside of the meeting context, right? Sitting at the bar or having uh, ad hoc meetings you know, over dinner, you know, that's when core issues a lot of times get resolved, and you can't really do that from an, in an online-only meeting. So uh, we, we're we back to a hybrid model now where we have an in-person meeting, but we allow online participation, um, and it's kind of uh, feeling its way through, but, you know, we, we're recognizing that uh, having face-to-face -face contact with people is really the best way to move the standards through the process as quickly as possible. Yeah, I have to react here. <laughs> um, no, but I need to speak like for the, the thousands of, of engineers who are going to 3GPP and I used to be part of those and maybe the rate of standardization has not gone down mu too much. The rate of burnout has gone up a lot, but also this other aspect, I think you're, you're talking to it very, very correctly, but another aspect I really would like to add right, is um, indeed as you have those face-to-face -face interactions, if you lose that by hiding yourself behind a screen, there's a very, very big thing that you're losing is that whenever you have those difficult conversations about this technology proposal, that other technology proposal, and you have to stand up in, fr in, a front, in front of like two, 300 people, peer engineers, and you're going to say something stupid, like if I'm doing something stupid now, and I have Harry and Gordon and Urska and whoever else I'm going to look at me, and uh, I'm going to have like a really, really high bar before I say something. I'm going to say something only if I know it makes sense and I've thought about it and it's in my contribution and it's well documented. Because if I stand up there and somebody is going to start attacking me, there's going to be some, something that happens to me. That doesn't happen when I'm behind the screen. I'm sure that we can transpose that to any other things that happen behind screens, but this is uh, definitely something that has happened and that we saw is that the level of disagreement and the level of uh, lack of progress on those very difficult topics has increased a lot, right? Because it's very easy for someone at the end of the email discussion that ends up at maybe 3 a.m. Pacific time, somebody says, oh, I object, without explaining, right? You wouldn't do that in a room, I wouldn't do that here, but you can do that on email. And so yes, to the face-to-face -face for the difficult topics, definitely I agree that there's something that's lost if you don't have that anymore. There's a bunch of others that you can put, you can keep virtual. Uh, there's routine agreements that you can do, but there's a lot of the difficult conversation between engineers that need to happen like face to face. And that's why I wanted to add for those, just a Very piece of- Very uh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, let me switch a little bit topic. Uh, this morning we talk a lot about technological leadership and Harry, you just mentioned it, you know, how it's important to have U.S. companies and how to incentivize them. So maybe a question from bo for both Harry and Etienne. So if we want to, if maintaining U.S. global technological leadership is a goal, then what are the right tools that the country should use to foster the ability of domestic companies to lead in global standardization? It's something else that should be done besides encouraging participation. We have heard investment to enable the development of the best technologies. How do we achieve that? Yeah, well, um, I think there are a number of um, uh, remedies that could be put in place to uh, incentivize that. Um, one is certainly uh, increasing the number of U.S. citizens who are uh, becoming engineers, uh, particularly at the PhD level, 
Um, and a second is um, uh, supporting SMBs um, in their you know, creation of technology. Um, so, and that can affect, for example, what we do at the standards level because we don't want to create a standard in which the only way to build a viable network is to have access to technology that only a handful of companies have access to. We want to be able to um, write a standard in such a way that any company, no matter how small, can um, look at the publicly available information and figure out how to build an implementation with their innovation in it. I think that if people can see a pathway to doing that, then I think that also helps. And part of that, too, is trying to understand the, the licensing landscape. Um, if a company submits a patent and, and declares it to be essential to the standard, currently there's no check to make sure that's actually true, right? So just because you have an SEP doesn't mean your, your patent is actually valid. It doesn't mean that um, it's essential to the standard. Um, and and uh, it, it doesn't you know, mean that it has any particular amount of economic value because it's part of a family, right? Because not all patent families are created equal. They're not really a unit of economic value. We've kind of simplified things for the purposes of license agreements, but it really um, does depend on the individual technology that's patented in terms of its real value. Uh, going through all of that would be a crazy amount of work because uh, we haven't we have tens of thousands of, of patents that are sitting there in, in these uh, that have been registered, um, and there is no formal process for of of um, engineers who are non-biased who are going through it to validate it. Um, but if there were something like that in place, then I think it would, it would uh, create a more uh, predictable landscape when it comes to figuring out, can I bring a, pr a product to market that's going to be competitive at a price point that um, the market will receive? Yeah. Thanks. Etienne, same question to you. How do we so promote US technology? Oh, yeah, to maintain U.S. technology leadership. Um, I think, I mean, on, on that, I'll, I'll, I'll try to not go back to the previous panel. We had some good experts de de talking about that. Uh, we I let them uh, continue the discussion. But in general, any reward to innovation, obviously, to me, is very important. Any reward to risk-taking, and this is more from the implementer side. And, and, you know, just to also mention to the audience, if it's not obvious, right, you know, it's not like the world is uh, split between innovators and implementers, right? There's a lot of innovators which are also implementers and, and, and vice versa, right? So it's not, uh, it's not like a, a big black and white uh, discussion here. Uh, so taking risks to implement something uh, that is in the standard, so anything that can remove the, uh, the barrier to be able to participate, to know what's coming down the line, to know what technology choices are being made in standard is definitely welcome. Um, Anything that, uh, but I think the, the rest is, is already in the, the U.S. Uh, standardization strategy. Basically, it's like anything that promotes uh, technology, uh, knowledge, uh, technology works of force. I, I would not say that those, that there needs to be like standards courses in, uh, in particular programs. You, you can, you know, know, know what's uh, happening. It, it's, a, it's more something that you learn on the job uh, type of uh, situation. I mean, you, you know your expertise. You're going to go and um, basically discuss it and uh, fight it off with other engineers. This is, I mean, for, for an engineer, it's actually, a, it can be a very rewarding experience. For others, maybe not so much. But for some people, it's actu actually being able to discuss your ideas, to be able to uh, uh, contrast what you want compared to uh, others uh, who comes from a different part of the industry. Uh, what type of requirement they want is, is actually really uh, enriching. So anything that enables these companies to be able to send uh, people to those uh, standard meetings, um, to me, is a is a win win for for those uh, for those companies. So I would leave it at that level. It's more rewarding innovation and uh, risk taking. Well, the other thing I would add too is that right now it's incredibly difficult for an engineer who's new to standards to come up to speed on these wireless standards. Right, the 802.11 standard is several thousand pages long. You look at the 3GPP standards; they're tens of thousands of pages long. Uh, it, it, it really creates a barrier to entry for new people to have to go through those documents and figure out how they work. So, for example, the 802.11 working group has authorized me to rewrite one of the annexes to 802.11 to make it an introductory section for new readers so that we can onboard engineers faster 
to get involved in the, in the standards process and feel comfortable participating in the discussions. Yeah, Gordon, U.S. technological leadership is a buzzword in, in Washington, D.C. Like all policymakers care about this, want to foster it. And it's certainly important, particularly in some key technologies. But at the same time, as we have learned today, it's also important to maintain a free and fair market competition within the standardization process where the best technologies are selected to become part of the standard. So how, to, how do we make sure that this geopolitical discussion and this desire to maintain um, technological leadership doesn't take us away from a merit-based standardization process? Thanks. I, I think some of the core here is a real focus on research and development and investment in research and development and not investing in activities that don't approach standards from a merit-based perspective, right? So you, what the very first thing in the U.S. standard strategy is this concept of adding investment into these critical and, te critical and emerging technology space in order to have that technology, in order to develop contributions that can be successful in standards based on their merit. Um, so we think that, that that really has the leading role for us. Um, and also, just to keep communicating across the United States and around the world about the importance of consensus-based standards development, which is open to materially interested parties. Um, you know, if you look historically, there are a couple of areas that focus in standardization. So here in the United States, we have the National Technology Transfer and Advancement Act. It's a really long act, has a lot to do with, with IP, and has two paragraphs about standards, and describes a set of principles for standardization that talk directly to balanced consensus-based standardization that's open and has due process. If you look at the WTO Technical Barrier to Trade Committee decision on standards, it really reiterates the very same principles. So globally, we all hold these principles. China acceded to the WTO, agreed to those principles. Europe has agreed to those principles. The United States has agreed to these principles. And so I think these are the principles that we need to communicate over and over again are the core aspects of standardization. Thanks. Any other comments? Yeah, I mean, the principles uh, uh, agree. I would add, uh, maybe that's covered in, in under it, right? But I would emphasize then the, uh, the aspects of governance within standard bodies. I mean, wh what you call the consensus-based uh, model of a uh, rule of operation. Um, you know, wh what I've seen um, in, in the last few years, because I, I've been in a, in a group, um, in a trade association called GSMA, where they organize Mobile Work Congress, so people usually know them. Uh, but they're a trade association of operators, and they used to be like on completely operator-driven uh, and centric, and you know, any vote or decision would be, yes, only operators can vote. And so at some point they realized, that, well, they were pushed to realize, but never mind. Uh, they realized that uh, that's not gonna work anymore if they're going to continue to do technical standards. And so, Eventually, you know, they created a, a governance model, and I'm now chairing their group that uh, basically oversees all their technical uh, bodies. And what we're spending a lot of time on is really like the type of governance that you need to put in place to make sure that you have the operators that have their viewpoints, but then the vendors that also have their viewpoint and that it's at least fair. And what you see is that actually when you engage with, with them, um, you know, people are actually willing to you know, be at the table and actually put down rules which are going to be at least, you know, pretty fair for uh, for everyone, right? I mean, knowing that, yes, in the end, it's still a trade association, the direction is going to come from one side, but at least the technical realization, um, the vendors are going to be able to uh, basically have their, have their voices heard. Uh, and if not heard, then you can vote. And if you vote, then you have the same, uh, the same way. So th that's why I would emphasize really this aspect of governance that needs to be really understood by uh, standards or people going to standards that there's actually a process and you know just because that um, other uh, company is not agreeing doesn't mean there's no uh, other way you have uh, recourses or you can try to convince other people um, so basically you know it's yeah I would really emphasize this governance uh, topics and the fact that you know as you engage into it you will find that the people on the other side of the table they're you know usually pretty uh, I'm not going to say always happy to engage but they're uh, happy to listen and to potentially engage and uh, get to better governance. 
So I think looking sometimes outside of this world, right? It's always interesting to me because I, I work across the plethora of standardization. Um, the SEP issues are a very, very narrow slice of standards. So if we move away from telecommunications and Wi-Fi and think about standards for baby cribs, would you want just baby crib manufacturers to write the standard for baby cribs? <laughs> Should we have pediatricians? Should we have regulators? Should we have people who are ex experts about mechanical injuries and mechanical hazards at the same table? Maybe even a couple of parents whose children have been hurt baby cribs, sitting at the table to draw that piece of elastic to the right compromise solution that sets forth a standard that's reasonable and provides for safe baby cribs, right? That concept is exactly what you're talking mm -hmm. about. And that pervades the way the US standards policy has been. It's called balance of interest. That's our buzzword for it. It's in the NTTAA. It's in the Office of Management and Budget Circular that provides guidance to the federal agencies about how to determine what voluntary consensus standardization looks like. It's alluded to, although not directly in the same words, even in the WTO principles. And so I think that's a great concept. Thank you for reinforcing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Harry, a question for you. So moving away from this topic a little bit, but there seems to be a general trend of moving away from public standardization to a, a, a standardization process where industry has a stronger role although with a variety of stakeholders included. And we have seen this in the United States that had traditionally this industry-led process. We have seen it elsewhere, including in China. Yet in Europe, we see a slightly different movement, as Gordon mentioned, through the EU standardization process, uh, uh, strategy, where more a stronger role I are, is given to public sector authorities. How do you see this development? How, how do you see the strategy adopted uh, by the European Union? Well, I, I do think um, it's a different approach. Um, I'm not going to necessarily say it's a bad approach. I would say it's a different approach. Uh, there are several differences between the European Union-based approach and the approach from US domiciled uh, SDOs. Uh, for example, um, in IEEE 802 standards, uh, we believe that when you purchase the device, uh, you don't have to pay a monthly fee to use the device. Um, in the EU world, you, you purchase a 3GPP-based device and you have to sign up for a monthly plan. Um, so th there's another kind of difference in, in, in terms of philosophical approach to the use of wireless networks. Um, I'm not going to say one's better than the other. There are pros and cons on both sides, but I think those are differences that the, uh, the marketplace will have to take into, con into consideration when they're looking to uh, adopt a wireless technology. Yeah, can I, I sure. have a different view? <laughs> okay. I think it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, now I need to nuance a bit, so I'll start with <laughs> the, the, the bottom line up front. Um, no, but so just to qualify, right, because I think what you're referring to is like in the EU model, like if you look at uh, a, a European standard organization like SEN or SENELEC compared to ETSI, right, where effectively you cannot participate unless you're part of a national delegation um, and you have to agree as part of the national delegation to um, have a particular country position and then only the delegates will go to the actual meeting to either vote, argue, or do whatever, right? Um, it's it, it might work for topics where you really have societal issues to discuss. Um, when you have like technology issues that you want to discuss, an engineer wants to talk to an engineer. Um, you know, the, the, the part with the, the, the parents and the dad and the baby crib is, is, is maybe one case. But when you're s uh, sorting a technology solution, I'd like to have engineers in the room to actually be able to sort out the technology uh, solution. Putting together the requirements, no problem. You can have many people around the, around the the paper uh, to talk what this uh, what this it's supposed to do, but to me this this model then of the national delegation that needs to you know agree and have a national position uh, that really like um, I don't know to me it really undermines this direct discussion that you want to have about technology. Then it, you it's really much harder to have a technology standard discussion when you have this mode of operation as opposed to you know like for example in Etsy or IEEE where you. Have, send the expert either as an individual capacity or for their employer and they go there and they discuss it right and they try to agree 
um, go, going through this model is, from what I've seen, it's, it's very inefficient. It makes very slow standards. Um, and, and I have a hard time seeing that it can tackle really complicated uh, problems. I'm sure there's going to be people who disagree that they've already tackled complicated stuff, but I, I really have a hard time seeing how they can really uh, tackle, for example, artificial intelligence type of uh, issues. This is a tough one. So I'll just so comment that Europe, the United States, we're all WTO members, and the TBT agreement tells us that we should rely on international standards as our first option in regulation, right? And the foundations of what it takes in process to develop a standard that's considered an international standard are laid out in the committee decision. I, I think just as a little bit of background, in the United States, this is really focused on regulations, really not, not on standards that are, provide features that are for the market, but on regulations. And in the US, the agencies, they're nimble. Right? So the policy tells them to participate in the development of standards freely, right? When it's aligned with their agency mission and they have the resources, what it also tells them is even when the standard's published, you can choose to use it or not to fulfill your regulations. You can pick more than one standard. You can pick a standard from a different market if you need to. You can adopt these standards in whole or in part, right? So the U.S. regulators are very nimble in their outlook at participating in the development of standards and the use of those standards. In the European Union's process, only EN standards produced by CEN, CEN, and Etsy provide a presumption of conformity. And CEN and CENELEC are connected to ISO and IEC by two agreements, the Vienna Agreement and the Dresden Agreement, that allow for rapid adoption of ISO and IEC standards into European regional standards and co-development of these standards. So they're tied to just that set of documents for their regulatory process. And in the United States, you see references in standards incorporated by reference for hundreds of different standards developers. And if anybody's ever interested at standards.gov, you can come and you can look at a website that provides you with data about standards incorporated by reference and see the variety of standardization models that US government agencies use to fulfill their regulatory obligations. Yeah, I, I just, fundamentally believe that uh, engineers shouldn't be uh, developing technology without guidance and input from the broader society who's impacted by that technology. So even though in the U.S. we have this industry-led uh, standards development effort, we do have mechanisms for government agencies to provide input from society, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, from the European perspective, um, certainly within their model, they can certainly um, appoint uh, scientists, engineers, professors, et cetera, who are experts in the field to help guide them through the development process so you don't just have um, administrators you know, calling, calling the shots on the details. So I think within both models, it can work um, if, we, if we really try to merge the two concepts together. Thank you. I do want to leave some time for questions from the public, but maybe just the last question for Gordon. Cooperation with like-minded countries is often mentioned as an essential component for maintaining this global standardization ecosystem. What do you think are currently the major challenges, if any, when engaging in such cooperation? In light of the ongoing geopolitical tensions, what do you think should be the main goal or goals when engaging in these discussions with the EU, with the Quad? I, I think the focus of engagements really has to be in several areas. One is really just sharing the concept and our belief in an open and consensus standards development process, right? Just reiterating that kind of same structure around how standards should be developed, particularly standards that are focused on regulation. Um, and also sharing information and connecting in work that happens before the standards, the pre-standardization research, right? Because again, that, that is the fertile ground to bring the best ideas forward into the standardization system. And some of the issues that we're looking to tackle, some of the issues in biotechnology that we're looking to tackle in quantum computing of the future, these are really huge issues. They're gonna have huge potential societal upsides, perhaps some potential risks for our society. And we have a lot of shared interest in working together to make sure that these technologies mature in a way that addresses the societal challenges that we have and really reduces the risks of negative impacts on our society. And that's a shared interest and it really needs to start at that research level. 
Uh, we also need to share information about what's happening in the current standardization system. I, I think one of the challenges governments face around the world is that standard system, although everybody thinks it's slow, there's a rapidly evolving standard system. There is a tremendous number of standards development organizations. There's a tremendous number of new work items, revision items. There's a tremendous amount of understanding of what's important and what we should be cognizant of. And the other thing that we are learning and should learn how to do more and more is not just work together as governments, but work together with our stakeholders. Because in most of these engagements, the stakeholders being a lot of the technical expertise into the standards that are needed to make excellent standards. Any other comments? No. Stephen, do we have time for questions from the public? Any questions? I didn't see any question, it's late. Well, maybe just one last question for everyone. But it, my takeaway from the discussion we had today is that, yes, yeah, certainly there are some issues, some abuses perhaps, uh, but overall the standardization system is working quite well. Uh, the self-regulation has worked in a way, and if, if what if that's the case what would be your recommendations for poli policy makers that focus on this field i think uh oh yeah if i <laughs> i mean i i think it, yeah it goes back to the first question is like wh why do i wish they what do i think they get right versus not right i think there's a, a lot of it which is uh you need to understand you know beyond the headline and beyond the things that you're able to count and that are not worth counting. Um, there's, m m yeah, there, there's a, a quite a bit more education that needs to be received from their side. Um, I don't know how we are going to uh, execute on that. I mean, I, I teach yearly a seminar to US government officials on standards, but you know, I'm only one person. Uh, <laughs> we need to scale that up, uh, but um, yeah, I, I think there's this communication, letting them know how the work in standards work, uh, how what you would lose if you don't have it, and uh, maybe calm down sometimes the rhetoric in uh, some of those groups would be uh, certainly useful. That's what I would say. I think too that from a policy standpoint, we really should emphasize more the importance of standards in our daily lives so that people begin to appreciate standards more and, and really understand their impact. Um, so, you know, like for example, um, a while back there were several train derailments in the Midwest. And, and part of the reason was because there was uh, no wireless communication with the train while it's moving through rural areas. And that's because there weren't any standards in place that made it commercially viable to deploy the wireless technology to accomplish that. So, so one of the things that I'm working on as a technical editor is to draft a new standard that would, that would be uh, deployed in a, in a private network uh, across the country to enable that to, 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 to happen. So now you're talking about saving lives, right? You're talking about you know, preventing accidents from taking place. So standards have a real impact in people's lives, and I think we need to do a better job of communicating that to the broader society and generating more interest in what we're doing and hopefully more involvement. So I agree with uh, my panelists here. Uh, I'll just reiterate a comment that uh, the leadership of the National Security Council made at the US standard strategy rollout was that standards are like oxygen. You miss them when they're gone. <laughs> ah, yeah. Uh, great discussion. So my question, am I audible? Okay. Um, so my question is not for anybody in particular. Anybody can answer that question. So um, we talked a lot about you know um, consensus-based standards participating from global, you know, every country, etc. There are a lot of technologies which are there in U.S. as well, which is export controlled. And uh, you know, government has certain regulations around it, but those are pretty critical for some of the countries which are outside the United States to get ex access to that technology for advancement. So any thoughts here, and I, I work for an MNC which is based out of US, so I'm, I'm very clear on the policies on you know, what, what is export control, what is not. But would love to know from the standards organization any thoughts, any you know, evolving thoughts around that you may have. I'll just go back to you know the story of the BIS 
standards rule, which has been my primary engagement, um, is that what we saw when the entity list rule related to standards originally came out is that the intention to push our strategic competitors out of standards backfired on us. It kept us out of standards, right? And so you aren't going to be successful in standards by trying to exclude standardization participation from other countries. It's not the way the world works, and it certainly isn't the way the global standard system works. Yeah, I would just reiterate that. I mean, what, what we saw was, what it felt to us is really like U.S. shooting themselves in the foot, at least for that particular aspect of things. I'm sure there's other aspects, but at least for that, there was a ripple effect that was definitely not, uh, not great for U.S. companies. So hopefully it's a lesson learned, and then we <laughs> try to avoid that. <laughs> And yeah, I, th I definitely think that um, the more we can do to encourage um, U.S. companies to offer competitive offerings, the better, right? I mean, it's one thing to say that uh, we don't want a particular foreign company to uh, sell products uh, that run our wireless networks in the U.S., but if there's no U.S. company that can fill that void, I mean, all you're doing is switching from one foreign supplier to another foreign supplier. You haven't really addressed the problem you claim to, to want to solve. And the way to solve it really is to is for the U.S. to have competitive companies who have competitive product offerings. And, and that requires, you know, encouraging the next generation to get involved and et cetera. Thank you. I think, Tim, with that, we have come to the end of our discussion. I would like to thank, uh, to thank our panelists for the very informative discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Urska. Thank you. Thank you. And I would thank you, Urska, for the great moderation. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I think it was a great conference. Um, I definitely learned a lot. Um, I think we can all agree standards matter and are important. We have to just communicate it to the world now. So thanks for coming in, Standard Nerds. I hope to see you next year. Thank you. Goodbye.